Today I want to talk about operating systems. More specifically, I want to tell you about what an operating system is along with a brief overview of a couple important concepts. After that, I will talk in a bit more detail about two specific components of an operating system, the file system and the process infrastructure. Now that you know what the video is about, you might have a question. Why are you making another video where you talk about operating systems just a month after releasing a video about Linux where you already talked about this? Well, there are three reasons. First, I gotta put my 60,000 Canadian dollar piece of paper called a bachelor's degree to some use, eh? Anyway, the second reason is that I was running short on time to release this video and needed a topic that I already thought about a lot. The third reason is that operating systems from a computer science perspective are dope, and I really wanted to provide an intuitive overview of a couple cool parts of an OS. Anyways, this introduction took too long already, so let's get going right away. Let's begin this discussion by talking about what an operating system even is. An operating system is a set of software that provides all the necessary infrastructure to make your computer actually useful. The most famous examples are Mac OS and Windows operating systems. These operating systems come with a lot of built-in software to manage your peripherals, run your programs, manage your computer's power states, manage your file system, and a lot more. All right, I'm done with straight up repeating what I said in the Linux video, so let's start with the original content. In order to make sure that you, the viewer, understand precisely what I'm talking about, I will be using a lot of examples, and those examples will be from the Windows 10 operating system, since um, that's the one that more people are familiar with. Moving on, an OS is split into layers, and we typically talk about two. One part is called the kernel space, and the other is called the user space. The kernel contains all the software that provides the infrastructure to make other software work while the user space has all the software that a user is likely to actually interact with. For example, in Windows, the entire desktop environment is provided by the operating system and is a user space piece of software. Another example is the file explorer, which is also a user space piece of software. However, the file explorer deals with the underlying file system through the file system drivers. These file system drivers are kernel level programs. Let's keep going with the discussion about user and kernel spaces for a bit longer. If a program wants to do anything meaningful, then it will have to communicate with and have the kernel do some of the work for it. And by anything meaningful, I'm actually quite serious. A program that only runs in user space without ever interfacing with the kernel cannot do anything useful, aside from maybe heating up your room with the heat that the CPU generates. Here's what I mean. If a program will have a side effect on a computer, it will have to go through the kernel. I'm sure that we agree that a program that produces no side effects is not useful. Just to prove my point, here's a Python program that almost everyone in the world has heard of. This is a meaningful program because it has a side effect. The side effect here is that the words hello world are printed on the screen when you run the program. And while you may think that this program is trivial, it does not change the fact that it is meaningful. And the kernel actually did more in making this program meaningful than you might think. Let's trace through the execution of this program while skipping a lot of the details. To be able to fully explain what is about to happen, I need to introduce a quick diagram. At the top in red is user space, at the bottom in blue is kernel space. Time flows horizontally. The black line represents which part of the operating system the code is currently running in. All right, once you call Python to run this program, the process that will run this program gets started and Python does its own stuff for a while, and then we get to just before the print statement gets executed. At this point, Python will recognize the print statement, take the string inside of it and ask the kernel, hey, please write this string to the file called stdout. The kernel takes over the program execution and does precisely that for a bit. And the code execution comes back to the user space afterwards. At this point, Python sees that no more stuff needs to be done and exits. So as you can see, if you want to print something, it has to go through the kernel. Now, if you're new in computer science, a couple things that I mentioned here might be at least a little bit surprising to hear. As an example, few new students realize that the process of printing to the terminal is actually writing information out to a file called stdout or standard out, and that is done by the OS kernel. Therefore, at this point, I think it makes sense to wrap up this part of the discussion and start talking in a bit more detail about the file system. Let me begin the discussion of file systems by actually mentioning an interesting thing I have heard quite recently. 
With the advent of mobile phones and their operating systems hiding file systems from the end user, there will come a generation of students that do not actually know what a file is at all until they go into a CS class. I found that to be actually a bit jarring to hear. After all, look, this is a file and this is a folder. A file goes into the folder. Doesn't get much easier than that, does it? But there is a dose of reality to it. Physical files are being phased out and it is actually rare that I ever need to look at a file of any kind on my phone. Anyways, with this weird thought over, let's actually talk about file systems properly. As I already showed you, the abstraction of a file in an operating system works similarly to a file in the physical world. A file is just a way to put together related pieces of data into chunks on a storage medium so that we can retrieve it later quickly. So a file system is just the entire system surrounding the file abstraction. There are many different types of file systems with different properties and different purposes, but the general idea is roughly the same across all of them. If you're interested in programming, then you will be using files all the time, both directly and indirectly. A direct use of a file or a file system is when you want to store some data on some storage medium with the expectation that it will persist beyond the lifetime of your program. An indirect use is within the world of inter-process communication. One of the most typical ways to communicate between programs is simply to write the data you want to communicate over a socket, which is an abstraction built on top of the file system itself. All right, I'm getting a bit ahead of myself. A socket is simply a temporary file that is used as an intermediate spot between programs to share data. Another indirect use is actually a bit tricky to wrap your head around, especially if you're new to CS. I already mentioned that when you print in Python, you print to a file called standard out. The terminal then sees that there is something there and displays it to the user. But what about taking input? Believe it or not, also done through a file. But this one is called standard in or stood in. Basically, the terminal will record the input from the user and write it to that file itself. Neat, huh? Oh, and there's another file called stud error, which is reserved for error messages, like a compiler error, for example. Let's quickly talk about folders. Actually, folders are basically just files that contain information on how to get to other files. If you want to think about it, Think of a file system as a linked list of linked lists, where each node has a pointer to the parent, a pointer to itself, and a pointer either to a block of memory on a storage device or another node in the linked list. If you want to see a much less hand-wavy explanation, look up inodes on Google. It's actually quite an intuitive approach to file systems if you have a basic understanding of standard data structures. All right, with that covered, I think we'll move on. I know that I left out a large number of topics and I really wanted to discuss hard and soft links here, but in the interest of time, I cannot. So let's continue with the video by discussing processes. The concept of a process is a far more abstract concept than the concept of a file and the file system. However, I'm sure that I can explain it in such a way that you will understand it at an intuitive level. Since the topic is super abstract, I will have to use much more specific examples to explain it. Let's look at the task manager. For example, here is a picture of what the task manager reports on the screen while I'm editing this video. As you can see, Windows reports a number of different processes, at least one for each program that you are running on your device. So what is a process? It is effectively an environment that the operating system provides and controls that a program runs in. It provides a chunk of memory for the program to use as it sees fit, a number with which to identify the program and a way to acquire more resources as needed. Now, the operating system actually manages when the program gets to execute, and believe me when I say, it is not all the time that it does. After all, look, there are dozens of processes running, but I have a CPU that only has four cores and eight hardware threads. That means that all of these processes need to somehow run at the same time while there are only eight places for them to actually get executed. That means that the OS creates an illusion of running everything at once by actually giving each process a tiny amount of time to do its thing before it moves on and runs some other process for a similarly small amount of time. The topic of how to manage this in such a way that all the processes actually get to run and how to manage the system when there are different priorities for the processes is actually quite complex and is called process scheduling. This topic is rather large and can have an entire video dedicated just to it. So if you would like to see a video on that topic, then let me know in the comments. And while you're there, maybe consider liking the video and subscribing to my channel. There are two more things that I would like to actually discuss. 
One of them is called threading, and the other is inter-process communication through signals. Let's begin with threading, as that is a bit more related to what was already mentioned. A software thread is simply a place in which to execute code with a tiny amount of its own memory that can run at the same time with all the other threads within the same process. A thread is not a process and can only run in the context of a process. A process can exist without threads, but a thread cannot exist without a process to run it. The operating system does handle the thread scheduling too, but a programmer can make their own thread scheduler, although the performance will be limited significantly to what the operating system can do. In essence, threads are an easy way to parallelize tasks, but it does open up the door for all the concurrency issues to show up. Managing concurrency correctly could be an entire video on its own as well. Oh, one more thing about threads. All threads have access to the same memory space that the process occupies. So inter-thread communication is actually quite simple. Just use the global scope. On the other hand, inter-process communication is actually a lot more complicated because each process runs in its own memory space. As I mentioned in the previous part of this video, processes can communicate with each other through the use of files in the file system. But that is not the only way to do it. There is also the concept of inter-process communication with signals. Signals are another abstraction provided by the operating system to all processes. There are signals like sig kill, sig abort, sig pause, sig alarm, and many more. Each has its own purpose, and most of the signals can have custom signal handlers written by the programmers to handle the communication. This form of communication is typically one way only, but that is enough for the most part. If you're feeling adventurous, you can actually make a chat program that is, has bi-directional communication with just sig user 1 and sig user 2 signals. Anyways, I feel like I'm starting to reminisce about the fun times I had in my operating systems class, more than actually talking about processes. So let's just wrap up the video instead. Alright, let's quickly recap what we discussed, because we discussed a lot of stuff here. We first talked about the basics of an operating system, along with the distinction between user land and kernel land. Then we followed that up with a discussion about file systems. We ended the discussion by talking about processes and a couple cool things that the operating system provides for them. That's a lot of stuff to take in, so congratulations on sticking through it all. I really hope that you found this video useful, insightful, or interesting at the very least. If you have, then please consider liking this video and maybe even subscribing to my channel. I talk about a lot of computer science topics, software engineering, and occasionally some other things related to living after graduating from university. Anyways, I'm just doing self-promotion at this point, so let's stop. Thank you for your time. Bye.